Taiwan's main opposition party, the Kuomintang, has announced its candidate for Taiwan's 2024 presidential elections. Former British Prime Minister Liz Truss gives a speech in Taipei, warning the West it must get real about military cooperation with Taiwan. For Taiwanese American Heritage Week, find out how two shops in New York are helping to spread Taiwan culture. Plus, we talk to a Chinese LGBTQ activist about what the closing of an advocacy center in Beijing means for gay rights there. A warm welcome to Town Plus News. I'm Jaime Ocon. Voters in Taiwan will head to the polls next January to elect a new president. The country's main opposition party, the Kuomintang, has announced who will be running on its ticket. Leslie Liao reports. After months of speculation and campaigning, Taiwan's main opposition party, the Kuomintang, or KMT, announced it's nominating Hou Youyi to run for president in Taiwan's upcoming 2024 elections. The selection came down to two people, Hou, who's the current mayor of New Taipei City, and Terry Guo, founder of Foxconn, the world's largest contract electronics manufacturer. This isn't the first time Guo has sought the KMT's nomination. He threw his hat in the ring for the 2020 elections, but lost that primary to former Kaohsiung mayor Han Guoyu. That outcome saw Guo quit the party. In early April, Guo announced his intention to vie for the KMT nomination again and apologized for leaving. This time around, Guo is taking the news better. He's already committed to supporting Ho's presidential bid. Ho is a former policeman who was involved in many high-profile cases. And he's been new Taipei mayor since 2018, enjoying high approval ratings. Voters vindicated his performance in 2022 when he was re-elected to his seat in a landslide victory, beating his challenger by nearly half a million votes. Ho says he will rise to the occasion. Ho faces a tough battle. He's going up against Vice President Lai Qingde from the ruling Democratic Progressive Party, another highly popular political figure in Taiwan. They're set to face off with former Taipei City Mayor and Taiwan People's Party Chair Ke Wenzhe. Ho has yet to speak in detail about many of his policy ideas, including how to handle China. The KMT favors closer ties with Beijing, which has proven a problem at the ballot box as Taiwanese identify less and less with China. Now that the KMT has selected its candidate, the scene is set for 2024. The party is now faced with convincing Taiwanese voters that Ho Youyi is the person they want as their next president. Yi Sun and Leslie Liao for Taiwan Plus. Former Taipei Mayor Ko Wenzhe has been nominated by his Taiwan People's Party to run for president next year. Ko founded the party in 2019. Ko said Wednesday he would lay out his platform in New Taipei over the weekend. He said the plans center on harmony, reconciliation and peace. The TPP nomination makes next year's election a three-way race. His opponent from the KMT will be New Taipei Mayor Ho Youyi, who was also nominated on Wednesday. They'll run against the ruling Democratic Progressive Party's nominee, Vice President Lai Qingde. On Tuesday, Vice President Lai said there's no need for Taiwan to declare formal independence, as it is already a sovereign state. Lai made the comments at National Zhengzhi University in Taipei. President Tsai Ing-wen has made similar remarks in the past. Lai also criticized the main opposition Kuomintang for holding on to the 1992 consensus, which acknowledges Taiwan as part of one China. He said this was following an old framework, ignoring the facts and submitting to China. 
Former British Prime Minister Liz Truss has called herself an ally of Taiwan. She's on a five-day trip to the country, which is under increasing pressure from China. On Wednesday, she called on the West to get real about military cooperation to avoid a conflict. Louise Watt reports. A former British Prime Minister in Taipei with a message for the West. The world needs to do more to support democratic Taiwan. Increasingly the target of threats from China, which claims sovereignty over the island nation. But fundamentally, we need a more coordinated approach, in particular to make sure that Taiwan has the defence it needs and is able to defend itself. We cannot pretend that we have meaningful deterrence without hard power. And if we're serious about preventing conflict in the South China Sea, we need to get real about military and defence cooperation. On the first full day of her visit, Liz Truss told Taiwanese officials and foreign diplomats that countries must stop appeasing China because they want access to its economy and instead support Taiwan because it's on the front line of the global battle for freedom. I believe that this is the most consequential place in the world for what is the most consequential struggle of our time. Trust said countries should reduce economic dependence on China. And she called for Britain to support Taiwan's application and oppose China's to a trans-Pacific trade bloc, which the UK is joining. Since Liz Truss stepped down as Prime Minister in October, she has advocated a tough stance on China, warning of its rising military power. Truss is the latest in a long line of politicians to come to Taiwan to show support as China has increasingly displayed its military strength. But as Britain's shortest serving Prime Minister, what exactly can Taiwan get out of her visit? Observers say not much. Uh, there's nothing substantive that can come out of this. It's true that Truss is a former prime minister, but Taiwan will have no concrete outcome out of this. I think Berkeley Taiwan hopes to have its foot in the door for higher profile visits from active politicians, people that are still active in political life through this. Uh, but at the same time, this does not always reflect well on Taiwan. Uh, Taiwan has become a place, for example, where politicians, particularly right-wing ones, clinging to political relevance will come to put themselves in the spotlight. Truss says she came to Taiwan because she was invited by the government. Foreign Minister Joseph Wu tweeted ahead of Truss's arrival, as authoritarian China continues to threaten democratic Taiwan, we need democracies around the world to stand with us. Liz Trust's visit reassures our people that we're not alone. We're ready to welcome her powerful words and vital show of support. But Beijing sees her trip as a nuisance, an interference in its internal affairs. In a statement, the Chinese embassy in London called Truss's visit to Taiwan a dangerous political show which will do nothing but harm to the UK. Truss's trip is also causing consternation within the British government as London tries to improve relations with China. Britain's Foreign Secretary said last month that isolating China would not be in Britain's national interests and he's expected to visit Beijing later this year. Whatever her image back home, Truss and her message of solidarity is welcome here as Taipei pushes to rally wider international support in the face of more and more pressure from China. Ricky and Louise Watt for Taiwan Plus. The international community's response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine serves as a deterrent from a possible Chinese invasion of Taiwan. That's according to Taiwan's head of the legislature. Take a listen. Ukraine都那么困难了，那这个民主国际都那么的合作，那我如果轻举妄动的话，可能会变成普京帝哦，让他不敢轻举妄动，他是对台湾是有帮助的。
Yoshi Kun was speaking at an event on Tuesday hosted by the Hudson Institute, a conservative think tank based in Washington, D.C. He touched on how Taiwan can learn lessons from Ukraine's defense of a Russian invasion. He also spoke about the importance of working with like-minded countries to safeguard democracy. This week is Taiwanese American Heritage Week, which celebrates the Taiwanese diaspora. We look at how Taiwan is making inroads overseas through its food. At this intersection in the heart of Brooklyn, New York, a little piece of Taiwan can be found. Across the road, a Taiwanese general store, selling things like chili sauce and dried fruit shipped directly from Taiwan. On one side of the street, a Taiwanese American cafe serves fresh rice balls and hot soybean milk. The owners of these shops say their goods are a way to promote Taiwan's campaign for international recognition. We noticed that like there, there wasn't a lot of a ton of options for contemporary Taiwanese American food, so you know we wanted to uh, really humbly bring it to our neighborhood. This is bacon pancake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These are like our pork bonton. This kind of exposure is crucial for Taiwan, which has seen its international space become increasingly smaller over the years. It's also one of the reasons why Taiwan's president decided to visit the two shops during a March transit stop in the U.S. Back in March, when Taiwan's President Tsai Ing-wen came to New York, she met with several overseas Taiwanese owners, and she expressed the significance of these overseas Taiwanese and Taiwanese Americans trying to spread the Taiwanese culture around the world. And while this eatery's Taiwanese cuisine is served with an American twist, the store next door offers visitors a chance to experience the real deal. Its design is modeled after a traditional gamadiam, which means general store in Taiwanese Hokkien. The owners say that while Taiwan is known internationally for its semiconductor and high-tech industries, items like these noodles, dried fruits, and the iconic Datong brand rice cooker are just as important. You know, we make semiconductor, we make chips, we make great bicycles that are everywhere, but no one has really tried to market Taiwan explicitly through these items. And I think food also hasn't really been a focal area yet either. And so now, you know, there's kind of a wave of Taiwanese food and Asian American food. And so we can really kind of uh, ride that wave and share more Taiwanese food with people. Just use it to make sure that the bottles don't break. This food wave is just one of the ways that Taiwan is looking to spread its reputation. Often, the threat to Taiwan from China and the country's cutting-edge semiconductor industry overshadow its other aspects. And that's why government officials say that Taiwan should show that it's not just the world's next flashpoint, and that it has more to offer than just computer chips. Taiwan used to be uh, more active engaging with the uh, local American community. The, uh, global semiconductor supply chains issue and with the regional uh, security issues. Taiwan is now more and more uh, recognizable by Americans. While many people might already know about Taiwan through cultural exports like bubble tea, the two shops in Brooklyn are hoping to expand the world's palate for Taiwan, one sauce or dish at a time. Jeremy Lin and his Kaohsiung Steelers team's season has come to a close, missing the playoffs by one game. Lin says he will use the offseason to think about his future. Bing Wong has more. Oh yeah, oh yeah, put your hands together. The crowd erupts in cheers after seeing basketball star Jeremy Lin take the stage. The season has just ended for the former National Basketball Association player and his current team, the Kaohsiung Steelers. Now Lin has a difficult decision to make about his future. Even his parents are weighing in. <laughs> Lin said playing in Taiwan felt like doing overtime, so he's excited to go on vacation. The Taiwanese American star burst onto the basketball scene in 2012 after his standout performances with the New York Knicks. He's the first American of Taiwanese descent to play in the NBA. 11 years on, he says he is in the late stages of his basketball career. 
在现在已经三十四岁，快三十五岁，我就是想一年一年来，那我也不想把这件事做得太大。我的我的意思只是说，我要回去真正的沉淀一下，然后，然后想。Jeremy Lin has etched himself into basketball history. A whole generation of Taiwanese and Asian basketball players look up to him. And while his future is uncertain, one thing is for sure: many basketball fans will miss him if he does retire. Jeremy Lin and Bing Wong for Taiwan Plus. Taiwan's legislature has passed a law establishing the Ministry of Agriculture. While the date of the official opening has yet to be announced, the ministry is expected to receive a larger budget to address agricultural issues. Bing Wang reports. Taiwan's Council of Agriculture is officially upgraded to a standalone ministry. Officials say the timing of the law comes as China's fruit bans are getting worse for Taiwanese farmers. Once it opens, this will allow the Agricultural Ministry to start multiple offices to address issues such as rural development, welfare of local fishers and farmers, and climate change. The upgrade will also increase the budget by 270 million U.S. dollars and up the number of personnel by 530. The larger budget will also help offset China's import bans on fruits, giving local farmers subsidies to sell in other markets. The introduction of the new ministry has won praise from many sectors. And also, they will have a new research institute focus, specific focus on the biodiversity. That will be kind of like uh, will be uh, have some benefit for us to tackle the uh, the uh, potential climate climate change impact. But not everyone's convinced. There are those who say some of its work, such as water conservation, should be left to the local governments and that the central government should concentrate on formulating policies and directions. There isn't an official date for the opening of the new ministry yet, but many are hoping for its success in achieving its laid out goals. James Lin and Bing Wong for Taiwan Plus. Coming up, why are these people in southern Taiwan dashing into the water? Find out after the break. Hello and welcome to Taiwan Talks. I'm Inka Vat. This very aggressive form of cultural revolution-like politics in China seems to be moving forward in this modern era. This grave injustice is happening. I think Xi Jinping will not give up his ambition. We need that kind of mindset to prepare for the warfare. What implications does this have on Taiwan and the region as a whole? Just like Ukraine right now, you need people to understand we're doing this for our own country. Reaffirmed our support for the Taiwanese ability to make their own decisions about their own future. It's very hard to duplicate in the short time. Taiwan still can continue being the leading position if we put efforts on R&D. And you are riding on a wave. This is exactly the time you need to double down. I did not realize I am actually running to be the first Asian woman in the state senate. Our next generation, they can see Asian American is as equal and have the same platform. Taiwan Talks provides a platform for the voices and perspectives that are shaping our country. Taiwan Talks, Monday to Thursday, 9 p.m. on Taiwan Plus. Thank you for watching Taiwan Plus. For more stories from here in Taiwan and around the world, download the Taiwan Plus app. Welcome back. You're watching Taiwan Plus News. Officials in Taiwan are warning the public to be on guard amid a wave of respiratory and other viruses. This warning comes after a five-year-old boy died from influenza. Cases of the flu and COVID have risen in recent weeks following the end of a mask mandate on public transportation. Taiwan has also recorded 12 new cases of Mpox, bringing the total number of infections with that virus to 91. Health officials warn that the wave could continue until the end of June. South Korea is now Taiwan's largest source of tourism, according to a new government figure. 
Before the COVID-19 pandemic, the number of Korean visitors to Taiwan each year was only around half the number of tourists from Japan. Tourist numbers are still only about a third of pre-pandemic levels. But the number of Korean tourists is now close to half what it was before the pandemic. Taiwan lifted its COVID travel restrictions last October. Around 1 million people visited the country in the first quarter of this year. The Taiwan Tourism Bureau hopes to attract 6 million visitors by the end of 2023. The Beijing LGBT Center, a nonprofit group serving the Chinese capital LGBTQ community, has closed after 15 years. The center was founded in 2008 to provide social services and organize advocacy programs. It had gained recognition for helping conduct mental health research. The closure comes amid a government crackdown on human rights and political advocates. A similar advocacy group in Shanghai was forced to close in 2021. For more on the situation in Beijing, our reporter Bing Wang spoke with Xiao Gang, a Chinese LGBTQ activist currently in Prague. What does this mean for the LGBTQ community then? Yes, I think this is a, very, a big last because, you know, uh, you, uh, the, the history of uh, Beijing LGBT Center is really important for the LGBT movement in China because this is uh, the first official, like, uh, physical space for LGBT people in China. So before there's all there's some LGBT organization, but they're not have this kind of physical space open to LGBT people in China. So I think it's a, this is a, a quite a big loss. So now that the center is closed, where can people go to? I think at least now in Beijing, no, which is sad. This is why I think it's a big loss. There's no any other physical center uh, for LGBT people. There's always like a gay related place, but I think center is a different because it, it not is provide like a you know the information that provide like a this uh, like a this like a lot of psychological help and uh, it was the place and people can really get together and feel safe, especially in China, I think. Uh, and also when you get there, it's that like you can openly talk about your identity and you know everyone will be so supportive. I think that's that's kind of like a, the, 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 the meaning of like the, the LGBT center. Yeah. That was Bing Wang speaking with Xiao Gang, a Chinese LGBTQ activist currently in Prague. Firefighters are continuing to battle wildfires in Canada's western province of Alberta. There are currently close to 90 wildfires burning in Alberta, and 24 of which are classified as out of control. Strong winds have spread smoke around, blanketing nearby communities. But officials say that the smoke is also helpful in creating cooler areas. It can help with putting out the fires. Environmentalists say that man-made climate change and rising global temperatures are a major cause of wildfires, which have become common in Canada and in other parts of the world. Taiwan's purple crow butterfly is one of one two migrating butterfly species in the world. One researcher has spent years following these butterflies and is now ready to showcase his work in a documentary co-presented by Taiwan Plus. Harold Hughes reports. Blink and you might miss it. Taiwan's purple crow butterfly changes seven colors in a matter of 10 milliseconds. This species is one of Taiwan's 400 butterfly species. But for documentarian John Jialong, this one stands out the most. John is a butterfly expert. His love for the purple crow butterfly began 20 years ago with a visit to Taiwan's Butterfly Valley. The experience left him in awe. He decided to start studying the species and took his passion to the next level, producing a documentary called Lost Butterfly. It took five years and millions of NT dollars to complete. But for Jian, the joy this project brought outweighed the difficulties. The purple crow butterfly is one of two varieties of butterfly in the world that migrates. The migration pattern is largely dependent on Taiwan's weather and vegetation. But a severe drought that hit Taiwan this year has affected the location and timing of their travel. While climate change is a major factor, it's not the only issue. 
。那不只是因为气候变成影响，同时人为的一些因素，包括开路啦、路沙啦，或是喷洒农药，这都是它在在迁徙之后那个很重要的危机啦。Chan and Kenting National Park recently began working together to better understand and protect the purple crow butterfly. They hope the species and its kaleidoscope of colors will remain an awe-inspiring sight for years to come. Emma Xu and Harrell Hughes for Taiwan Plus. Taiwan's southwestern county of Jai held an annual Downhouse Festival on Tuesday. Sally Jensen has more. <laughs> Dashing into the water to welcome the visiting king. What you're seeing is an annual religious celebration in Taiwan's Jiayi County that's been held for over 180 years. The sedan carriers in this Taoist ceremony represent different regions of Taiwan. Together they dash into the water to usher in the king deity, who arrives on an invisible boat. Dragons are there to lead the way. Thousands of visitors come every year to witness the spectacle. 这样的一个故事啊，那充满的是我们人的福气，啊，包括我们地球平安。The ceremony concludes with firecrackers on the newly renovated pier. Safety is the priority. Taoism is a major faith tradition in Taiwan, and as part of Taiwan's intangible cultural heritage, this colorful event is not one to miss. John Su and Sally Jensen for Taiwan Plus. Thank you for watching Taiwan Plus News. Remember to download the Taiwan Plus app for more stories from Taiwan and around the world. Finally, today we leave with the images of the largest kelp forest in the world and its biodiversity in Chile's Patagonia. I'm Jaime Oka, and take care, and see you next time.